So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the symposium on listeriosis, jointly organized by the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists and the Sri Lanka Medical Association. The topic is listeriosis. Is it another pandemic on the horizon? So just to give you a brief uh, outline of what happened, uh, this symposium came about due to the mass media and social media hype created during the couple of weeks. So we hope this symposium um, will educate our fellow professionals regarding the various aspects of listeriosis. So today we have four speakers who will each talk on different aspects of listeriosis. The first speaker is Dr. J.C.P. Rajendra, consultant physician at Teaching Hospital Ratnapura. His topic is case presentation, tragedy at the summit. Over to you, Dr. Rajendra. Good afternoon. First of all, I thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of uh, Microbiology for giving me this opportunity to present this case. Okay. My case is, um, uh, she, she is Mrs. I, in 51 years old housewife from Valley Murder. She was transferred from district hospital Eratna to teaching hospital uh, Ratnapura on 25th of uh, February 2023 around 2.30 p.m. So on admi the reason for admission is he had fever with headache and vomiting, several episodes, altered behavior for one day duration. At that time, she didn't have any history of fits. So the interesting travel history is there. She developed this illness when she was at Adam's Peak on 24th February, helping her brother in a food stall. She was sick, so she came down and went to a district hospital, Eratna. From there, she was transferred to teaching hospital, Eratna. She has interesting travel history. Uh, from 16 to 23rd, she was at Adam's Peak. And 23rd, she came down to Kuruvita. And then he climbed Sripada on the 24th. So this travel history and everything, uh, my uh, uh, co-speaker, consultant epidemiologist will do. So she has no history of chest pain, no difficulty in breathing or palpitations, no history of abdominal pain or diarrhea. She did not have any respiratory symptoms. She was being in investigated for arthralgia and myalgia for about 10 days prior to the sickness, but investigations were not completed. She did not have any significant past history such as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or vascular events like ischemic heart disease or stroke. She was not on irregular medication, but time to time she is taking some drugs for joint pain. She didn't have any history suggestive of leptospirosis exposure. So initially, this patient was seen by my uh, the ANEMOs and my SHO, and they have assessed the patient. Uh, as usual, the ANE, they do the ABC, which was normal, and blood sugar was 156, saturation was 98%, and patient was very febrile, and the GCS was 10 by 15, the motor 5, I4, and verbal 1. And the blood pressure was 130 by 80, and the uh, pulse, rate, uh, uh, pulse rate was 90 per minute. And there was neck stiffness, this is an important finding. So based on this initial uh, assessment, uh, they made a clinical diagnosis of meningitis or meningoencephalitis, and uh, they did the urgent NCCT brain, and blood cultures were sent from the ANE, and full blood count CRP and the electrolytes were sent. And they have started IV capteoxone 2 gram BD and acyclovir 10 milligram per kilogram, that is 500 milligram eight hourly. And uh, NCCT was seen by the ANE MOs in the console, it was reported as normal. With this investigation, patient was transferred to casualty medical ward that day by my casualty day. So in the casualty ward around uh, 4, 4.35 p.m. I saw the patient, I examined, examined her. Uh, she was ill-looking, febrile, and confused. She's not pale or ecteric. She had enlarged, she, she didn't have any enlarged cervical limb nodes, no conjunctival suffusion, no finger clubbing, no ankle edema, no skin rashes. Her joints were normal and they were not swollen or tender. So cardiovascular system is normal, blood pressure 120 by 80, respiratory system is normal, the saturation was 90%, but she was a little bit tachypneic. 
abdomen was normal, the liver spleen not palpable, it was not tender. So the central nervous system, the GCS remained same, 10 by 15. She was restless and febrile, she had neck stiffness, and pupils equal and reacting to light, and no ptosis or ophthalmoplegia, no facial asymmetry. She had weakness on the right upper limb and the lower limb, and the planters were up going on the right side, down going on the left side. So based on these neurological findings, uh, neck stiffness, fever, uh, fever, headache, and vomiting, so we made the diagnosis of meningoencephalitis, so whether it's a viral or bacterial or leptospirosis. Because leptospiral, uh, last two, uh, within a month, we had two leptomeningitis. We had a Japanese encephalitis. We had viral encephalitis. So we don't know what's the cause for this presentation. So an important question that we need to answer now is, why patient had focal neurological sign? Is he having any focal cerebritis or cerebral abscess? So what I did was, I, in addition to caprioxone 2 gram BD and acyclo 500 milligram 8 hourly, I added IV vancomycin 1 gram BD. By this time, we got all the reports that were sent in the a &E. So these are the investigations that we, initial investigation that were sent in the a &E. You can see almost in all the investigations are normal. And interestingly, the CRP was 5. And white cell count, not that very high. And the renal functions and the liver functions, all normal. So this is a NCCT vein reported by the consultant radiologist. Uh, and they reported as white matter demarcation is preserved. However, cortical sulci effacement in both cerebral hemisphere, this finding may support the clinical suspicions of leptomeningitis because why he put leptomeningitis as we discussed with the radiologist when we asked for the report and we told her differential diagnosis. No cerebral edema, basal cisterns are normal, no infarction or ICH. No intracranial or extracranial collection, paranal sinuses are normal. Right, so patient was in the ward with the treatment. Around 8 p.m., we were in the ward. That's a Saturday night, casualty night. Uh, we do the uh, routine night ward rounds. So we got the information that patient has got the fit. So it was a GTC fit, fit and it lasted for about a minute or two. And uh, it subsided with a small dose of medicalam. And you were, we are given IV elevator rest in one gram. Uh, what happened was when the patient with this normal CT brain, we were planning to go for a LP. So we did the formal uh, neurologist referral. Uh, we were thinking about going for a LP. But after patient developing the GTC fits, we decided not to go for a LP because patient may be having some other lesion. So we decided to go for the repeat CT brain. So anti IV antibiotics were continued with acyclover and oral levetiracetam, one gram BD continued via NG. And vitals were monitored. At that time, I wanted to send the patient to ICU. Unfortunately, there were no ICU beds available, but anyway, we spoke to the anesthetist and we, we booked a bed. So on day two, that is on 20, sorry, this is March 26th, February. 26th of February morning, a GCS remained same as 10 by 15, no further fits. Right-sided weakness remained same. At this time, uh, both planters were upgoing. And we did the uh, NCCT brain. We repeated the NCCT brain. And it was reported by the radiologist. Symmetrically involved bilateral periventricular white matter edema. No ICH, no hydrocephalus, no infarcts, no evidence of venous sinus thrombosis. So this is mark change compared to the first CT, the second CT there was a mark change that the patient had a significant bilateral periventricular white matter edema. So this is a CT that you can see. There are significant white matter, symmetrical white matter edema. So we discussed with the uh, consultant neurologist and we decided to give one shot of uh, IV dexamethasone 8 milligram. And we also discussed with a consultant radiologist, and uh, they agreed to go for MRI or uh, contrast and, and CT brain following day, that is on Monday. This is a temperature chart in the ward. You can see the patient is having a very high fever spikes. On day three, patient condition deteriorated. It is 27th of February, early morning. Uh, condition deteriorated, and GCS has dropped to eight 
and patient is tachypneic and saturation started to drop. She was oxygen dependent. So without waiting, I intubated the patient in the ward and started ventilation, ventilating him. Fortunately, we were able to get the ICU bed at that time and we transferred the patient to ICU for advanced care. And antibiotics and liver teresitum were continued. Uh, that is ceftriaxone, vancomycin, and acyclovir. And contrast brain was arranged. Interestingly, at this point, though the patient is confused and we intubated, the blood pressure was maintained, but she had tachycardia, unexplained tachycardia. And uh, we thought maybe having a myocarditis, we called the cardiologist and we did the echo and it was normal. And it responded to oral bisoprolol. By evening, the CECT report was available. This was a CECT report. Subtle chiral and meningeal enhancement with hypodensity in brainstem and mild effacement of cerebral sulci and basal cisterns. No collection or abscess formation noted. No hydrocephalus or midline shift. And the impression was subtle chiral and meningeal enhancement suggestive of meningoencephalitis. Now, now we are sure that patient is not having any focal, neuro, uh, focal lesion, abscess or any other collection. So there are no absolute contraindication. So we de decided to go to do the lumbar puncture and it was done on the same day. And this was the lumbar puncture report. You can see the, the appearance was turbid. The protein is 495 milligram per deciliter. The glucose 0.1 millimole. The random blood plasma glucose was 8.3, which, which was very low. And the cell counts, polymorphs are 8,270. Lymphocytes 440, red cells 3600. This is a pleocytic picture with high polymorphs. So it's more in favor of pyogenic meningitis was confirmed. So we continue the antibiotics. At, the, at this point, we stopped the SA clover. Uh, since the patient condition deteriorated and having the ICS of protein, IV dexamethasone was continued. We had a discussion, me and neurologist and an anesthetist had a discussion and we planned, uh, we, we thought of continuing the IV dexamethasone. On day four, that is 28th of February, 2023, we got the blood culture report, which has isolated listeria monocytogens and is sensitive to ampicillin, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline. On consultant microbiologist, Dr. Geeta Naneka's advice, we have started IV ampicillin two gram four hourly. And IV vancomycin was omitted. This is the summary of laboratory investigation done in the ICU. You can see most of the investigations are normal. Right cell count is minimally elevated. Minimally elevated. And interestingly, you can see the CRP was normal. Persistently, CRP was less than five. And latter part only, it has risen up to 19. And the procalcitonin was 0.57. That is just upper limit of uh, systemic infection. This I can't explain. Patient had a pyogenic meningitis, but CRP is normal. The renal functions were normal. Liver functions were normal throughout the illness. And latter part only. Last day only a creatinine went up to 119. A blood picture was suggestive of bacterial infection and uh, infection induced thrombocytopenia. Urine culture, gram negative enteric organisms isolated, which is sensitive to capataxin. Uh, Retrovirus screening was negative. Chest X ray uh, was normal initially, but repeated X ray done the ICU showed few inflammatory opacities. Ultrasound scan abdomen was normal except the fatty liver. So we got the culture report, CSF culture report on uh, 1st of March. And uh, it isolated listeria monocytogens, which is sensitive to ampicillin, chlorophenicol, and vancomycin. And again, we started vancomycin, restarted, and continued with ampicillin. This is a temperature chart. In the ICU, you can see the patient had very high fever spikes initially, but the fever settled. Then on day four, that is on the second, the fever started to appear like a step ladder pattern. Patient had very high fever spikes. With this high fever spikes, her blood pressure started to crash. Until this point, 
his blood her blood pressure was normal she was not on any inotropes but after this fever started to rise her blood pressure started to crash we have to add uh, one by one several inotropes first we had no adrenaline then we added the vasopressin then we added the adrenaline and finally we had to add the dopamine also the vitamin as well on 3rd of march she had recurrent cardiac arrest and she was resuscitated in the icu and unfortunately she has succumbed to her illness around 2:30 pm so our anesthetists tried their best during this period to save her life and they did various measures to do to, but unfortunately everything was futile so this is a timeline just to show the she got sick at the adam speak and admitted to district hospital aratna on 25th she was admitted to teaching hospital ratnapura at 2:30 am uh, where we they had a provisional diagnosis of encephalitis meningoencephalitis on the same day any we have started the iv ceftriaxone and acyclovir and all the investigations were sent on 26th antibiotics were continued on 27th we did the ct brain c ct brain which was there is no focal lesions and lp was done and 28th we got the lp report suggestive of pyogenic meningitis on the same day we got the listeria monocytogens isolated from the blood so there was only the three day gap from the admission on 25th to 28th within three days we were able to isolate the organism in the blood and we were able to start the appropriate antibiotic to the patient because we sent all the investigations from the ane as soon as the patient admitted to ane so on march 1st csa culture was isolated listeria which was sensitive to vancomycin and on march 2nd as i said earlier the, the patient's temperature increased with that uh, blood pressure started to crash on 3rd around 2:30 pm patient has died so non pregnant patient listeria monocytogens can cause four types of illnesses one is gastroenteritis something like a food poisoning the incubation period about 24 hours and second is a invasive disease and third one is central nervous system infection we call neurolisteriosis and other one is a focal infection like skin and eye infection cholecystitis peritonitis pneumonia myoca myocarditis and endocarditis so in this invasive condition the incubation period can last for about several days so i try to do some uh, literature survey to find out uh, the the prevalence or occurrence of uh, neuro listeriosis in uh, other countries uh, in, in, whether it was reported in any journals i found two interesting articles this is a uh, uh, article i found it was a little bit old in 19 published in 1998 medicine baltimore usa and uh, the article is uh, central system infection with listeria monocytogens 33 years experience at a general hospital and review of nearly 800 patients and it's all these patients are non pregnant patients not the pregnant non pregnant patients with neurolisteriosis and second one it was published uh, recently in 2017 in lancet infectious disease the clinical features and prognostic factors of listeriosis the study called it as mona lisa study mona lisa national prospective cohort study here they assessed about analyze about 260 patients with neurolisteriosis so i just tell the summary of their findings highest incidence of neurolisteriosis before the before the age of 3 and after the age of 50 years this is very important clinically when we encounter adult patient with meningitis more than 70 years we empirically start ampicillin just to cover the possible uh, listeria monocytogen but we don't consider starting uh, uh, ampicillin young people but that study has showed Uh, the highest incidence of neurolisteriosis before the age of 3 and after the age of 50 years even some of the guidelines even the up to date is recommending to start consider neuro um, uh, listeriosis any patient presenting with meningitis after the age of 50 and uh, most of the patients are immunocompromised the common things are malignancy hematological malignancy organ transplant steroid therapy and hiv positive 
but 36% of the patients, there are no underlying diseases were recognized. The normal people also can get. About 33% of patients had focal neurological signs, or, or patients had a focal neurological signs. Unfortunately, contrast CT didn't reveal anything, but according to the uh, review articles, we have to do the MRI brain to find the focal neurologic lesion. MRI is the ideal one to detect the uh, focal neurological lesions. About 25% had seizures, and 87% of patients with neurolysteriosis had meningoencephalitis, and only 17% had brainstem involvement. The another important thing, role of adjunctive dexamethasone in neurolysteriosis is questionable. In the Mona Lisa cohort study, they have mentioned de dexamethasone won't do any beneficial effect. Usually we start dexamethasone in bacterial meningitis, especially for the pneumococcal. Sometimes the patient is sick, uh, empirically we start high dose uh, dexamethasone. But they, the, they have analyzed the 250 patients and they found out dexamethasone won't do much benefit in patients with neurolysteriosis. And another important point is neurolysteriosis mortality is higher in blood, blood culture positive patient. Our patient is, he has neurolysteriosis, he has a culture positive as well as blood culture also positive. So your mortality rate is very high. So going back to the patient, what went wrong? What happened? Why, why did the patient die? So we can analyze this in a three ways. The, the patient factor, whether it's an organism factor or the treatment factor. So I would say it's a late presentation. So I told that uh, that lady has, uh, in the, at the summit from 13th, uh, 16th to 23rd, then she came down to Kuruvita and she was there for about one, one day seeking some medical advice. Then she went back to uh, Adam Speak. Uh, during that time, she had uh, arthralgia, arthralgia and myalgia. So probably she, mu she must be having some prodromal symptoms. Last slide. And we, we, we started the appropriate antibiotic early, but we didn't start the ampicillin on day one. Role of dexamethose in neurolysteriosis is questionable. Whether beneficial or not is very doubtful. Even, even, the, even some of the review articles are not recommending to give dexamethasone. Potency of the IV ampicillin used. Presence of any immuno immunocompromised condition, though the supposedly we, uh, we patient didn't have any immunocompromised condition, she could have had some subtle diseases. Organism may, may be more virulent, which is not responding to our standard antibiotics. And uh, obviously delay in ICU care. If you get send the patient to ICU early, we could have done something better. And finally, neurolysteriosis mortality is higher in blood culture positive patients. Thank you. By uh, the message is uh, now is a the case is a good eye opener for us. Anybody presenting with anybody having more than 50 years, we presenting with. Uh, symptoms of signs and symptoms of meningitis or meningoencephalitis, we should think about listeriosis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajendra. Uh, so the second speaker is Dr. Geeta Nanayakkara, consultant microbiologist at Teaching Hospital Ratnapura, who will talk on the role of the laboratory in listeriosis. Thank you very much, uh, Namal. And uh, on behalf of College of Microbiologists, I welcome all the guests and online uh, friends as well. And uh, this is actually, I must say that this uh, uh, chaos or rather eye opener <laughs> who created by me because uh, the first case from Dr. Rajendra, uh, I got the blood culture, got positive. And then once the first patient passed away, the second blood culture got positive, like, you know, I'm still thinking that it is listeria from a 16-year-old girl from another VP of another medical ward. That is how I correlated with this, and she also climbed Adam's Peak. Uh, she presented to us on 3rd of March, that is, uh, sorry, 7th of March, and we got the positive blood culture next day itself. 
Unfortunately, we couldn't isolate the uh, listeria because of the contamination, but the gram stain is quite possible with listeria and the same presentation, and she succumbed the same day. And the JMO's uh, post-mortem findings uh, shows that uh, uh, necrosis of bowel. So we thought, and that is how it is uh, created, and I have put a message to my colleagues' uh, group saying that please uh, get the better social history. That is how this has been started. Okay, right. So uh, some of my slides actually will overlap with Dr. Rajendran's uh, um, explanations. So I will pass them. And uh, Listeria. Uh, is a serious infection usually caused by eating contaminated food, everybody of us know. And infection most likely sickened pregnant women, newborns, adult age, and immunocompromised. Uh, other people can be infected with listeria, but they rarely become seriously ill. Uh, with my experience also, I haven't seen uh, at this young or without immunocompromised patients, like, you know, what we get so far, what we ha I have got is all, almost all uh, are adult patients about 70 years and one or two neonates uh, from the neon NICU. Listeria monocytogens is a gram-positive bacteria. Uh, infection in humans and wide variety of animals. Uh, it's designated uh, by ONH antigens. And serotypes 1,2A, 1,2B, and 4 cause almost all human infections. And it's a ubiquitous in nature. So found in moist environment, soil, water, decaying vegetation, animals, and sewage. All these conditions are very much, you know, uh, it's higher up in the Adam's Peak. Everything is there to harness uh, listeria. <laughs> okay. It can survive and even grow under refrigeration, 4 to 10 centigrades, and other food preservation measures grow at wide range of temperatures as low as 2 centigrade. Uh, sodium chloride high concentration, like 10%, and pH of 4.5, it can survive. Some strains are resistant to biocides as well. An organism can form biofilm, which facilitate the survival. And it's a facultative intracellular pathogen, invades macrophages and most tissue cells of infected hosts where it can proliferate. So overview of pathogens once it's enter, and it enters to the, uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, virulent factors like listeriolysin O, uh, interlinalin, and phospholipases, bacterial uh, surface proteins, and it uh, enhances entering to the cells, and once it's uh, taken up by the macrophages and tissue cells. Uh, it internalization of host cells, and then it escapes from the phagosome, enters to the cytoplasm, and goes to the adjacent cells, and spread from one cell to another. And it escapes through the pears patches of the gut, enter to mesenteric lymph nodes, and then enters to bloodstream. That is how it goes to the favorite place, that is the liver. And it enters to the hepatocytes. And early recruitment of polymorphic nucleus, uh, nucleus, uh, nucleus uh, cells will lead to uh, spread the disease to the uh, causing bacteremia and then septicemia and exposing uh, brain and the placenta. So prognosis depends on severity of meningoencephalitis. And it prefers to go to the brain stem causing rhombencephalitis. There are two types, as Dr. Rajendran said, it, it, invasive illness defined as isolation of listeria from a normally sterile site, typically blood or cere cerebrospinal fluid. So we have got both positive from the first case. And usually start within two weeks after eating contaminated food. It can go up to two months even. And uh, intestinal illness, symptoms of intestinal illness usually start within 24 hours after eating contaminated food. Last one to three days, some people with intestinal illness develop 
invasive illness as well. And the sites of infection, I think uh, uh, the previous speaker has elaborated, but I will go just go through it. Uh, CNS listeria accounts 2% neonatal and 4% adult bacterial meningitis. And present with uh, encephalitic symptoms, that is cost like 87%. And diagnosed is positive CSF gram stain is 30%, and CSF culture is 85%, and CSF PCR is 60%. Bacteremia, especially elderly adults, neonatal sepsis, uh, mortality rates, rate is high. Pregnancy, maternal blood cultures, 55% accounting, and placental cultures, 80%, with 20 to 25% fetal loss. And the other thing is gastroenteritis, focal infections like peritonitis, bones and joints, plural, cardiac, UTI, biliary, adeni biliary adenitis have been reported. Symptoms wise, the symptoms may vary with the infected person. There are three categories like you know, high risk people other than pregnant women. They can get fever, muscle aches, headache, stiff neck, confusion, loss of balance and convulsions, which has been uh, uh, presented uh, with our pa both patients. And pregnant women uh, typically experience only fever, just like uh, non-specific symptoms like chills and headache. Uh, but they, are ha they can get miscarriage, stillbirth, premature delivery, or life-threatening infection of the newborn. And healthy people rarely develop invasive listeriosis. However, people exposed to a very large dose of listeria bacteria can develop non-invasive illness with diarrhea and fever. If a person has eaten food contaminated with listeria and does not have any symptoms, most experts believe that no test or treatment are needed. Even for people at higher risk of uh, for listeriosis. And diagnosis is by culture. Listeriosis is uh, usually diagnosed when a bacterial culture grows listeria from a body fluid or tissues, uh, blood, spinal fluid, or the placenta. So the first case which we have been elaborated uh, got, the plus blood, uh, got the blood culture two days after uh, the admission that is on 27th, the automated blood culture got alarmed and we have grown it and then issued the results on 28th. And uh, 29th, we have got the positive CSF culture and we have confirmed and issued the report on 1st of March. Stool culture has not been evaluated as a screening tool and it is not recommended for diagnosis of hysteria because you can get uh, like, you know, intermittent shredding and then uh, because it's a ubiquitous organism so you can get contaminated with the uh, food and people are uh, intermittent shredding is there so we are not taking it as a uh, screening tool or it's not sensitive and specific for diagnosis of listeria and there are no serological testing also recommended. Management, patient management decisions for asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic people are appropriately made on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, exposed but asymptomatic, so you don't need testing or treatment. And uh, asymptomatic person with elevated risk of invasive listeriosis who ate a product recalled listeria monocytogen contamination Still, you don't have to start anything, but you can ask patient should be instructed to return for medical treatment if he or she develops symptoms of listeriosis within two months after eating the recalled product. So usually they get fever, myalgias, diarrhea, or other gastrointestinal symptoms. Exposed afebrile mild symptoms uh, the people with that minor gastrointestinal low flu-like illness such as mild myalgias, mild nausea or diarrhea. Alternatively, uh, such a patient could be tested with blood culture and some people say you have to start antibiotics and wait for the blood culture. If it is negative, you can uh, stop treatment or some other school of thought is there. Uh, you don't have to start until you get the positive or negative blood culture result. 
So antibiotic regime could consist of oral ampicillin or amoxicillin. Uh, if the blood culture yielded listeria, standard antimicrobial treatment for listeriosis, that is IV ampicillin and gentamicin would be indicated. Exposed fever and symptoms consistent with invasive listeriosis. An exposed person with elevated risk of invasive listeriosis with fever and signs of sim and symptoms consist, of, uh, consist with uh, listeriosis. Uh, then diagnostic testing should include blood culture and CSF culture, as indicated by the clinical presentation. The antimicrobial regime should be st uh, standard therapy for listeriosis, typically including IV ampicillin uh, and gentamicin for 14 to 21 days. Uh, they are, the, again, as uh, Dr. Rajendran said, we should avoid dexamethasone that is provided. Uh, we isolate the organism. Uh, but otherwise, we usually start dexamethasone in other case of meningitis. If uh, blood culture is negative and symptoms resolve, antibiotic therapy may be discontinued. And there are alternative antibiotic treatment regimes as well. You can try Cotrim, uh, Cotrimexazole, and Meropenem. Linazolid and Rifampin also, uh, they are also active, but experience is limited. And management of pregnant women with presumptive exposure to listeria. Uh, this is from the guideline from the American College of uh, Gynecologists and Obstetricians. Uh, maternal infection may present as non-specific flu-like illness. However, fetal and neonatal infections can be severe, leading to fetal loss, preterm labor, neonatal sepsis, meningitis, and death. Uh, the incidence of listeriosis associated with pregnancy is approximately 13 times higher than in general population. And this is how uh, the algorithm to uh, manage this presumptive exposure to listeria in pregnancy. Uh, if the patient is symptomatic, yes. Then if the patient is febrile, yes. Then you have to test for blood cultures and treat with ampicillin. And if, it is, uh, if the patient is unsymptomatic, then no testing or treatment is uh, necessary. And uh, uh, if the patient is webrile, uh, then expectant uh, management may consider obtaining blood cultures. And this, I thought of uh, uh, adding this because we might not look for these miscarriages in our country, uh, as uh, the other said. Uh, we are not looking for listeria in, in these cases because we are getting repeated abortions or repeated uh, miscarriages, but we are not looking for listeria so far. So I don't know whether we need to start that as well. And these are the references that I have gone to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Geeta Nanayakkara. Uh, so the next speaker is Dr. Thilanga Ruan Patrina, consultant epidemiologist at the Epidemiology Unit. The topic is investigation process and the immediate preventive measures of the reported listeria case. Over to you, Dr. Ruan Patrina. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, College of Microbiologists and uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting me <coughs> to deliver this uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the public health aspect of uh, listeria case reported recently. Uh, so the, my objectives would be for today's talk, uh, the introduction and the epidemiology of listeriosis, followed by the global and local situations, then the public health investigation process and the preventive activities, and uh, uh, then we'll, uh, I'll talk about this uh, joint investigation process with our veterinary colleagues, and finally the follow-up process. So in uh, introduction, uh, so many, many things uh, maybe overlap with my uh, previous speakers. Please, uh, my apologies for that. Uh, the, this is a foodborne infection. Uh, it's caused by a bacterium uh, called exterior monocytogens. And the incubation period, it says uh, from few days to it can go up to uh, even 90 days. 
uh, the commonly caused by eating uh, the improperly processed meat, uh, food products uh, prepared with uh, raw milk or unpasteurized milk products like ice cream or yogurt. Then uh, obviously it's a zoonotic disease and a wide range of animals including cows, goats, uh, even dogs and cats can be the host. Right. Then uh, the healthy people rarely get the disease, uh, but it could be fatal in following groups of individuals. Uh, and the common clinical presentation is encephalitis or meningoencephalitis. So when you come to the uh, epidemiology of listeriosis, it's more common in uh, temperate or cold climates. It's a rare disease. Uh, the incidence uh, is reported as 0.1% to 1 to 10 per 1 million population and uh, but the case fatality it's ranging from 20 to 30 percent and the reservoir is either soil or GI tract of asymptomatic animals <coughs> then the bacteria can grow in refrigeration temperatures like it says from 4 to 44 Celsius the bacteria can grow so this is very important in public health point of view as well then the transmission, uh, it's uh, from animal to animal uh, via uh, fecal route, from animal to human uh, via milk, cheese, meat, eggs, uh, contaminated vegetables, or contact uh, with uh, infected animal, that is direct contact with infected animals. Then uh, I reviewed, uh, I found two uh, meta-analysis conducted in uh, 2022, they report uh, the listeria monocytogens contamination rate in food, animal, or reservoir sources. Globally, the first uh, meta-analysis said global prevalence is around 10.3%. The second meta-analysis uh, they did in uh, the papers uh, collected from Southeast Asia region, uh, they are, uh, the, uh, the prevalence is 16%, so it's higher in our region. Then uh, the second uh, group of people, they reported this out of this 16%, 21% uh, they found in ready to eat food of vegetable origin. So it's fairly high. So when you come to this uh, global uh, situation in 2010, the estimated number of cases were 23,150 and uh, 5,463 deaths globally. And uh, according to uh, European uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control, they say the France, Germany, and Italy had the highest number of cases in 2021. And uh, f uh, past outbreaks, the CDC reported uh, at least uh, four to five listed outbreaks in each year. For last year, 2022, they said uh, they have reported five outbreaks in their website, the all through uh, frozen food items and most of the, almost all food items were recalled. And uh, uh, when you take the, the biggest outbreak, which was reported in South Africa in uh, 2017 uh, to uh, 2018, and uh, they said 1,060 lab-confirmed cases with 216 deaths. And uh, uh, even Germany, they have reported an uh, outbreak in 2018, and the cause of food was sausages. Now let's uh, look at the local situation. Uh, Listeria monocytogens contamination in food samples were found in 38% in a study conducted by Gunasena, Kodikara, Ganepola, and Vidana Patrana in uh, 1995. So out of that 38%, uh, vegetables were found to be having 49%, chicken 34%, and dairy products uh, were 26%. And another group of uh, researchers, Jayaman and Samar Jeeva in 2011, uh, they have done uh, out of uh, 265 samples tested, 39, that is around 15% were positive for listeria. And uh, their breakdown was cow's milk 29%, goat milk 27 uh, even pasteurized milk, they said it's 17% and cheese 33 likewise. Uh, now I'm going to uh, give you a glimpse about the surveillance system in Sri Lanka and uh, there are 29 communicable diseases under surveillance uh, by the epidemiology unit and out of that 29, 16 diseases have the in uh, special surveillance in addition to the routine surveillance 
and out of that 16, 11 diseases are uh, vaccine preventable diseases where our medical officer of health, uh, he personally should investigate and the balance has to be investigated by the public health inspectors. So this is again just a recap. So this is the list of uh, notifiable diseases in Sri Lanka. So when you count all these things, it comes up to 28 and uh, the last one is any other disease that are unusually high in numbers. This is again I want to show you the trend of uh, food and waterborne diseases in Sri Lanka over a period of time. So you can see uh, a reduction throughout the years. Um, I mind you this is out of the reported cases. They may be unreported, but out of the reported, uh, you can see a downward trend. But in 2021, that is uh, during the COVID period, it's due to uh, reduced number of reporting. There was a slight increase uh, in 2022 because of the re reporting has come back to normal level. Okay, so because of uh, this, uh, you should have noticed Listeria is not a notifiable disease up to now. So we don't have the disease burden or trend uh, available. So several cases have been reported to MRI and uh, other hospitals and uh, no reported uh, past outbreaks in Sri Lanka. So now I'm getting to the, uh, the public health uh, investigation process of this particular case. So uh, a death of 53 years old lady due to Listeria was reported on uh, 6th March. Uh, actually it was informed to our uh, uh, consultant community physician at Ratnapura by the microbiologist of uh, TH Ratnapura. And uh, there were two more deaths, uh, 6th and 12th of March, uh, and one ICU patient with similar symptom signs uh, were informed from the same hospital. And uh, we actually at that time we did not identify this as a food poisoning outbreak uh, because uh, it's only a single confirmed case of listeria and uh, it's not a vaccine preventable disease usually uh, in vaccine preventable diseases our norm is even a single case we consider it as uh, outbreak and uh, the chance of going into outbreak proportions of this particular disease is very small however we noticed uh, some peculiar things in this particular case uh, all four were females all were within a week uh, period from uh, climbing the adams peak Except the uh, disease, the first disease uh, patient, all three were uh, less than 20 years of age. And uh, only the disease, the first disease uh, patient was identified as having listeriosis and all shared common clinical presentation. So because of these reasons, uh, we decided to undertake a detailed investigation. So uh, preliminary investigation process was explained to the, our regional team and the process was regularly followed up. Then uh, first uh, we took, a, we advised to take a detailed history, uh, which is from the BHTs, uh, which is already collected the information. Then uh, additionally from telephone interviews, and uh, more than that, uh, our people went to the houses of uh, these patients and collected uh, more information about this situation. And the demographic uh, details, contact details, and of the people were collected, especially the route of travel was collected the past medical history, especially uh, just before climbing uh, the Adams Peak was specifically collected. Then uh, detailed food history uh, was taken. So what they brought from home and what brought uh, bought during the climb. And especially we uh, collected the landmarks of the shops just to link uh, to the sampling process later on by the public health inspectors. So what they have consumed uh, from Dan Cellar, which is available uh, throughout the uh, routes, and uh, water, tea, coffee, and other drinks uh, bought or consumed from the Dan Cellar and their location. So all these details were collected. And a sequence of events took place uh, and treatment taken from hospitals and GPs were all collected. Finally, investigation findings, management, and cause of death also collected from the BHTs and the hospital. So. Uh, if I take the public health aspect of the, the first deceased lady, so it's a 53 years old uh, female from uh, Lunuat Valley, Valimada area. So came to her daughter's place a month back to support her food stall at the mid Kuruvita Sripad road and uh, climb up uh, on 16th February and returned back uh, on 23rd February due to an illness. 
and on the same day uh, she has visited a GP and complained about body aches, edema and uh, the blood pressure noted as 90 by 60 and the GP has advised to get admitted to a hospital immediately. In spite of those advices, she climbed up again on 24th where she developed this vomiting, headache, uh, loss of consciousness, altered consciousness and uh, admitted to Ratna Hospital uh, and then transferred to ICU and uh, Ratnapur Hospital ICU then passed away on 3rd. So my, uh, uh, the, the previous speaker told about the, the medical component of it. And uh, in addition, we found that she had a cattle farm in Valimada as well. So this uh, picture tells you uh, the, the routes available for Adams Peak. So there are uh, actually five routes. Uh, now here it shows only three. The first one is the Hatton, that Nallathani way, that's the shortest one. Then the Ratnapura Palabaddala road, then the Kuruvita Ratna, the route and the Malimbada route. So the first, uh, uh, the deceased lady, actually she uh, came up from that uh, Kuruvita Eratna road, but interestingly, the second, third and the fourth, all three, they came up through this Ratnapura Palabaddala road. And uh, so if you take this one, the public health aspects of the history, so the ages were like this, and uh, they were belongs to different uh, MOH areas. The first lady from Kuruvita, and the second one from Ayagama, and third one from Nivitigala, and uh, fourth one uh, from Surya Vava in Hambantura district. And you can see the dates of climb also different from each other. And the routes also they have uh, taken uh, first one from Kuruvita and uh, the others were Ratnapura route as I said earlier. And uh, we investigate, we uh, inquired about the uh, health of the rest of the group, rest of the people in that group and everybody was found to be healthy. And uh, day before climb, uh, the how healthy were they? And uh, the first lady actually we found uh, she was on some sort of, uh, um, she had some uh, fullness of the body or some arthritic condition. But second one was apparently healthy. Third one, uh, though she did not mention of any illness, but uh, the relative said she was on paracetamol due to some fever and body aches. The fourth one again apparently well. Then finally, uh, listeria was identified only in the first one and uh, you can see the, the cause of death given at the end as well. So here, uh, by looking at uh, these things, uh, the areas and uh, the dates of climb and the route of uh, uh, routes that they have taken to climb up the Adams Peak, so we came to uh, a final like uh, we came to uh, sort of idea like this most likely an isolation case of listeria. So outbreak is unlikely at this point and uh, the preventive activities were further strengthened, uh, the inspection of the hotels and the food outlets and the dance cellar and uh, everything uh, and the health education for the food handlers were carried out and the water quality surveillance were further strengthened and uh, we advise our uh, regional team uh, to collect all these samples uh, from all three routes, the Kuruvita route and Ratnapura route and the Maskelia route. And uh, we collected uh, uh, water samples, food and milk samples and milk product samples and all were sent to MRI. And uh, finally, all samples were negative for listeria, but they were positive for some other things, uh, but not for listeria. And uh, since this is a zoonotic disease, uh, because it has a long incubation period, maximum of 90 days, and uh, this disease lady, the first lady, had been in Valimada before coming to Eratna, and preliminary investigation by the uh, area MOH of Valimada informed us there were a lot of cattle farms and they sell milk as well and listeria is, uh, is, is a zoonotic and uh, you can get uh, listeria in cows, goats and other domestic animals and then uh, it can cause encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, septicemia, abortion and stillbirths in cattle as well and because of this reason they in veterinary epidemiological bulletin also they have talked about this listeria in ruminants, we decided to have a, a joint uh, investigation at uh, Valimada area. Uh, further, 
this is what uh, WHO also recommending uh, the One Health approach. Uh, so One Health meaning uh, it's a collaborative, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach working at local, regional and national and global levels with the goal of achieving optimum, optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people, animal, plants and, and their shared environment. So what we did was uh, we spoke to all these uh, people, the public health teams in uh, Badulla and veterinary teams and we arranged uh, a joint investigation team and they went and they met all these cattle farm, farmers. Uh, the human sector, uh, they uh, investigated about the symptoms suggestive of listeriosis among the cattle farmers and uh, in during the first three months and uh, they could not come across any symptoms suggestive of listeria. And the veterinary colleagues, uh, they uh, took the histories of recent abortion stillbirths of cattle because it's a very common uh, symptom among especially the cows, um, the abortions, and symptoms and signs suggestive of neurological disorders of uh, these animals. Uh, and uh, they also couldn't find uh, a, 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 a disease suggestive of listeria. Anyway, for the completeness, they took uh, samples and they sent to uh, Veterinary Research Institute uh, VRI at Peradeniya. Especially they took the milk samples, nasal swabs, and uh, finally all samples found to be negative for listeria. Uh, finally, uh, so that is how uh, it has uh, evolved. But uh, due to some uh, adverse media publicity, you know actually what happened there. So people who visited uh, Adams Peak recently with the diarrheal diseases got panicky and they got admitted to various hospitals in our country. Uh, so to screen these people, actually we developed a, a suspected case definition uh, which consists of uh, visited Adams Peak within past two weeks and with fever, diarrhea, vomiting and headache and admitted to hospitals and we gave this to our regional epidemiologist and to go and take detailed histories. And uh, these cases were reported from Badulla Hospital, Ratnapura, Kegal, Anuradhapura, and uh, Gampa Hospital as well. And we followed them up, but uh, all were discharged within one or two days. So in prevention, so, uh, so in general, we have to thoroughly wash the uh, raw vegetables, then uh, follow proper hygienic uh, practices at food preparation, domestic as well as in commercial settings then uh, boiling or pasteurization of milk, then cook meat and meat products at high temperature at, for adequate time. So this could be the reason uh, why this is not reporting in our country because we always used to cook our um, uh, meat and other products for a longer period uh, at high temperatures. So avoid uh, contact with sick animals. So uh, this is uh, the uh, investigation process and the outcome of uh, this uh, listeria case reported. So with this, uh, actually we worked out the human sector and the, as well as the veterinary sector and found uh, there's no outbreak as such. And uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, our consultant community physicians and all three districts and the regional epidemiologist, all three districts and our veterinary colleagues at Badulla and uh, Dr. Sujata Patiragi, uh, consultant microbiologist at MRI and uh, Dr. Ginige, our chief epidemiologist for their guidance. And uh, these are the references uh, I went through. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ruan Patirina. So the last speaker is Dr. Sujatha Patirage, consultant microbiologist and head department of food and water microbiology at the Medical Research Institute. The topic is listeriosis as a foodborne pathogen. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Sri Lanka College of Microbiology and the SLMA for inviting me for this talk. And uh, I will be uh, talking on listeria as a foodborne pathogen but uh, I think most of the things are already covered, but there are a few interesting things as well. Uh, I think uh, the introduction source of transmission and current situation in Sri Lanka and how to control. So probably the last two points are the things which uh, probably I may have to talk on. And uh, there had been many outbreaks 
uh, worldwide and case re pet, uh, relative rare disease with a high mortality. And there had been many outbreaks, as Dr. Ruan Patirana mentioned. Uh, and it is found everywhere. Uh, but uh, as a foodborne pathogen, uh, the, uh, this is very important for us because uh, uh, unless we have a good control measures, this is a very good uh, opportunity for this organism to contaminate food. Uh, because we, uh, food, uh, uh, where it comes from the farm to our table, throughout this process, uh, Listeria is capable of surviving, contaminating, surviving, and uh, multiplying in various stages, uh, challenging all the control measures in place. Uh, so human carriage rate is uh, about 5 to 10 percent. So as it is mentioned now, this organism is capable of uh, uh, surviving uh, and multiplying in refrigerated temperature, low pH and high salt concentration, which are we in food uh, industry, these are used as uh, like increase in the shelf life of food. Uh, these are the measures being used, but still uh, Listeria can survive against all these measures. And in addition, this biofilm formation, which uh, mentioned earlier as well, but in food industry, this is a major area because, uh, because of this biofilm formation, quorum sensing, this organism can found in the food processing environment where a uh, lot of cleaning measures may not be able to uh, remove this and uh, even after this prepared food, if contact on these food surfaces can uh, again recontaminate it with the listeria. And I think in developed countries, this is one of the uh, main reasons where foodborne outbreaks are linked to uh, food processing environment. So again, this is the growth and survival characteristic, though the optimal temperature is as for any other organism. Uh, the temperature is 30 to 37, pH is 7, but the, it has a wide range of uh, uh, survival limits. So as mentioned, it is the main uh, source of transmission is uh, through the contaminated food, 80 to 90%, but uh, other, uh, as earlier mentioned, uh, there are the measures of transmission as well. Uh, I think uh, I would like to show you the Sri Lankan situation in human cases. These are actually I gathered for this presentation by uh, writing to our own colleagues, uh, microbiologists uh, around the country. Uh, so this is the situation already. This, this, uh, uh, this data only for three years, 2021, 2022, and 2023. We had... Uh, uh, almost, actually, I have not added four more cases, but already there are 21 cases. All are positive blood cultures, plus there are two. One is uh, the Colombo, there was a one from a placenta. Listeria was iso isolated when, uh, from a, um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, um, from a, uh, it is a abortion, and placenta was sent for uh, culture. And then there was another from uh, Jaffna, where uh, it is from uh, amniotic fluid culture. Again, it was positive for listeria. And uh, we have started uh, testing food for listeriosis. Uh, actually, now, uh, food microbiology, though uh, we were practicing testing food for microbiological parameters for many, many years in the country, uh, Food uh, Act or the regulations did not have microbiological parameters. So most of the microbiological criteria we used were from the Sri Lanka Standard Institute standards, which were adopted by the Ministry of Health uh, for the regulation purposes. Uh, so. Uh, we were actually now, uh, it was a uh, situation, but now it is changing. Mm. 
So ID, uh, identification of this organism, now clinical laboratory is have practicing a different method, but for the food it is uh, very difficult. Uh, we, ha we are having a very cumbersome method of uh, identifying this bacteria. Uh, I think I, I missed this now. After commencing our testing, uh, actually we had one milk-based product which was positive for listeria. This was a very recent one. Uh, identification, uh, there are various laboratory phenotypic methods which are routinely used by most of, of, a, uh, of our laboratories. There are rap rapid identification kits, automated systems, and molecular uh, testing, as well as serotyping, serotyping which will help us to type these organisms to find out uh, whether, like, uh, how related these bacteria to, like, compare the uh, pathogens isolated from clinical samples and the isolates uh, uh, from the food samples. Uh, so most foodborne outbreak, uh, the strains are uh, the 1 to A, 1 to B, and the 4B. Uh, that is the uh, international overall uh, world situation. Uh, this is the, these are the types of uh, zero types. Uh, but uh, we have uh, done uh, zero, uh, the uh, serotyping in our setup, and by using multiplex PCR, uh, our findings uh, we uh, have used uh, control strains and our EQA samples, and uh, we had uh, uh, isolates from uh, 4B, uh, 3, uh, 3 were 4B, and uh, 1 to A were the uh, other three. So that is uh, more or less similar to uh, other zero uh, the serotypes uh, reported from the uh, other areas of the world. So food testing, I said that it is a cumbersome procedure. Uh, so uh, it is uh, samples are collected by the uh, public health inspectors uh, and. Uh, the transport and then uh, testing is carried out by uh, food laboratories and the, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ruan Patrin mentioned, it's uh, like in VRI, other places, they are also carrying out this test. Um, and confirmation, as mentioned, by automated system or the uh, PCR. So now the issue is, uh, now this is a ubiquitous organism found in everywhere and food is the con uh, most uh, uh, the common route of transmission and it can uh, challenge or the survive or, uh, with most of the uh, food preservative mechanisms and uh, storage mechanism. So the, these are the basic things like uh, pasteurization and cooking and then uh, the WHO has uh, uh, given the guideline on uh, the five steps to prevent uh, re uh, contamination of food and to remove the pathogens from the food. Uh, we have to, like, even at domestic level, these are very important to practice because we see many cases with, like, uh, though we are cooking food and washing, but still we see patients who are having foodborne pathogens. Most likely, when we go to the history, most likely it may be at their own kitchen level where the cross-contamination occurs. Even babies who are very young are having sometimes foodborne pathogens, diseases with foodborne pathogens. Uh, so in addition, now uh, there are uh, food which are uh, labeled as high risk. So people who are uh, of extremes of age or the uh, immunocompromised who are likely to or high risk to get uh, listeriosis uh, should avoid this high uh, risk food and they should be very careful about shelf life because now uh, there are uh, the pasteurization and uh, other measures uh, are done and then there are microbiological criteria to decide whether this product is safe. This microbiological criteria apply only for the given shelf life. If the product is uh, beyond the shelf life, it may, by that time, the 
uh, pasteurization does not kill all the microorganisms. Usually it is supposed to kill uh, pathogens, but not, uh, it doesn't kill all the uh, bacteria. Uh, because of that, if it exceeds the shelf life, the microorganisms which are there will exceed the uh, satisfactory limit or the harmless limit. So we have to, uh, the especially high-risk people should adhere to uh, the shelf life of the food product. And cooking is uh, one of the uh, important methods to kill this bacteria. And uh, in other countries, they have uh, like given guidelines what not to eat and what, uh, what can be uh, consumed for all these uh, people who are like pregnant or the uh, people who are at risk of developing uh, can get the listeriosis. So when it comes to control, yeah, I think outbreak control, Dr. Um, Ruan Patirana mentioned, and what we should do at national level is very much important here. Uh, now I have shown you 21, uh, more than 21 cases over the last three years, uh, but we don't have at the moment surveillance mechanism for these foodborne pathogens. And there is no notification for uh, the in place for listeriosis. Uh, we have already discussed this for some time because I was uh, seeing this uh, trend uh, since last year. So we have discussed this at uh, various uh, levels. Still, I think uh, Adversary Committee on Communicable Disease should take a decision on to implementation of notification and surveillance. And uh, the uh, though we are like uh, doing outbreak investigation as a whole, I think we have to uh, implement the traceback investigation where after dietary recall, we should look for all the possible places, possible food items, but it is very expensive, very time consuming. Uh, that is how developed countries are doing, but uh, there should be some sort of like at least, um, uh, probably we may have to get together with the stakeholders in the food industry uh, to educate them uh, what are the important measures they should take to prevent these things. And when, if the food is found to be contaminated, we must recall them from the market. And in addition, regulatory enforcement is very important to control this. Now, regulatory enforcement, uh, we are working with Food Act uh, 1980, and there are hygienic regulations for the food industry and uh, premises regulation for the food industry. Uh, then this is the, um, uh, these are the new uh, regulations which are coming up. Still, these are at the draft state, but we have included listed uh, monocytogenous as uh, uh, food microbiological criteria for uh, relevant food items. So now, uh, when we talk about the control, the regulation is there, but uh, the, uh, there are various issues we can see in that. Uh, because it's integrated uh, approach should be taken from the farm to the uh, farm transport, then uh, to the food processing industry and uh, to the vendor. So they should have the good hygienic practices, good manufacturing practices. And there's, uh, in food industry, there's one called hazard analysis critical control point where they identify uh, what are the most critical point in the food chain which can contribute for contamination of the product. So they are very particular about these points and they have to do the uh, control and there should be validation of the process to uh, find out uh, whether the, uh, their process is correctly in place. So in food microbiology, we have uh, uh, three form of testing. One is the food hygienic criteria where uh, we, uh, there are parameters which indicate uh, whether the production process is operating in a hygienic manner. Uh, then there are food safety criteria where we are uh, looking at the food bone pathogen with uh, the microbiological criteria in, uh, properly in place to produce safe food. In addition, uh, environmental monitoring is being done, especially like uh, you can see with listeria, it is very important because some of the outbreak, it is the environment of the same uh, food processing uh, premises which, were, which was contributed for 
uh, for some of the outbreaks. So uh, these are the challenges we face. Uh, now, the bacteria organism is having its own features, own qualities, which overcome the control measures. And we need to strengthen our epidemiological investigation. And we need to uh, strengthen our food control system, which should apply from farm to fork. And especially uh, high-risk food, we have to pay our attention more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patirage. Now may I invite Dr. Lucian Jayasurya, uh, past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and senior member to chair the Q&A session. And may I invite all four speakers on stage. Thank you, Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have had four excellent presentations. Of course, it took a little time than we, we planned for. But I think it was very, very well discussed and very well presented. So are there any questions from the audience? Uh, have you got any questions com coming from the uh, on ch online and on, on the chat? Still, this is found. I can from my. I don't know how old exterior this is. How, how old? It's a very old disease. Named after Joseph Lister. When is that? Yes. Oh, it's just okay. <laughs> because when we studied microbiology in the medical faculty in the 1960s, of course, we didn't know about it. So, right. Uh, any, can any I question? ask one question? Yes. I'm a physician working in Kandy. It's uh, from Dr. Rajarin O, Dr. Gita Anakar. Uh, because uh, if, in the, uh, if it is uh, penicillin uh, sensitive uh, in this allergy for penicillin, what's the antibiotic that you recommend for an invasive hysterosis? Yeah, uh, I think I have given the alternative antibiotic treatment, which has been uh, given at the uh, Joseph. Uh, John Hopkins uh, guidelines, uh, what they say is you can use Cotrim, Cotrimexazole, which is not available in IV forms yes. in our country. Yeah. And uh, instead, you can use IV meropenem. And linosolid and uh, rifampine is also active, but there is le less experience. So those are the three alternative treatment than ampicillin. Uh, my experience is even though the patient is penicillin resistance or penicillin allergy, uh, you can use uh, in the same, even though it is the same group, beta-lactam group, the meropenem, you can use. Okay. So that's an option that what we have. Yeah, thank you. Another is, can I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, what's the minimum incubation period like? Is it uh, like a, a, even a one or two days? Could it be? Yeah, that is what I have. I mean, uh, Dr. Ruan Patrina also elaborated, like, you know, uh, the intestinal disease, it's one to three days. You can present, right? And invasive disease, it goes up to 90 days, 90 days. according to his, and uh, I have come across it's two months. Mm -hmm. okay. Because the one, uh, two, from who had actually climbed the Adam's Peak, okay. the following day itself that they have got similar episodes at that uh -huh. time, actually, we did not know about this uh, Listeria thing. Okay. So, but they settled. Uh, uh, yeah, even minute. both of our patients who died, it's within one or two days, uh, and within two weeks, like. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Okay. There is a question from the online mm -hmm. audience. Dr. Yes. Kushlani Jaya Tilaka is asking, were any pathogens isolated from other disease patients? You are talking about it, huh? Relating 
to this uh, outbreak or rather this case scenario or uh, she has throughout? A mention. She has a mention. Okay. <laughs> For this actually, as I told you in the beginning, the second case, uh, uh, the 16 year old girl's blood culture got alarmed, but unfortunately it got contaminated. So we couldn't trace it, but the gram stain is, uh, uh, the, which is similar and the patient's presentation is also very common with the same symptoms. Is that all? Uh, there is one more question. Uh, what is, uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Udayanga, what is the role of a primary care setting in managing this situation? Yeah, um, we have, uh, usually the guideline says, uh, um, national guideline says anybody more than 65 or 70 years presenting with uh, suspected meningitis, we empirically add uh, ampicillin. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, now what, um, that's the thing we are doing all these days. Uh, this patient was 53 years, so uh, when she came to ANE or uh, casualty medical ward, uh, we didn't we made a diagnosis of uh, meningitis, but we didn't think about the listeria. So uh, in future, anybody more than 50 years, uh, I think we should uh, keep in mind we have to suspect uh, this type of organisms as well. Regarding the previous question, Dr. Jayatilaka says, yes, in this outbreak after death in post-mortem samples. No, actually they have not taken uh, the post-mortem samples. Uh, the first case we haven't done the post-mortem, that is after five days, so we have given the, the positive yeah, inquest and then given the uh, cause of death. The second, sample, uh, second case also they have done the uh, post-mortem but not taken samples. The initial blood culture got positive. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't trace the listeria from that. I think that answers uh, Professor uh, Chinnaya's question. Wasn't any post-mortem uh, conducted on deceased patients and specimens cultured, especially in those, list in those listeria was not isolated? I think I have already answered. Yeah. Those are the only online questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it made me thank all the speakers for the excellent presentations and uh, thank the committee, SLMA Committee on Communicable Diseases uh, for, for getting this presentation done on listeriosis. Thank you. <laughs>